Hi, it's Kate, and this is the fourth video for week two of Math 23. In this video, we're going to discuss how we can use vectors and matrices and work with complex numbers. Let's begin our discussion. We've already mentioned complex numbers when we were listing examples of sets that are fields. You may need a little bit of refresher on what a complex number is. Remember that a complex number is written like this. There is both a real and imaginary part. The part I've labeled A here is the real part, and B, while it is a real number, is the coefficient on I, an imaginary number, which is the square root of negative 1. You may or may not recall that when we're adding complex numbers together, we add the real parts together and we add the imaginary parts together separately. And so complex numbers really lend themselves to being represented by vectors very nicely because vectors also, when you add them together, the first components are added together and the second components are added together but they're each kept separate from each other in this process. So here's what a vector representation of a complex number would look like. We keep the real and imaginary parts as separate components within the same vector. And of course, if we had multiple complex numbers, when we added them together, the real parts would add together and the imaginary parts would add together, but they would stay completely separate from each other in the sum. We see here also that it says that the modulus of the complex number is the same as the length of the vector that it represents. And you may be wondering, what's the vector that it represents? I mean, we've written this down, but how can I picture it? Well, remember that the way that we graph complex numbers in the complex plane looks something like this. We graph the x-axis with the value of the real part of the complex number and the y-axis is the coefficient on i, or the b part that we've written up here. So when we're looking at something like a plus bi, here's where it may be. Here's the a component, or the real component. We go over a units. And then the plus bi is represented by going upward b units, the imaginary coefficient. Here's our point a, b which in the complex plane represents a plus bi, and here's the vector from the origin to that point. And so when we say the modulus of a complex number is the same as the length of the vector, well, modulus in this case means absolute value. And so the absolute value of a complex number is actually written like this. And so when you see that the absolute value of a complex number is a squared, the real part, plus b squared, where b is the coefficient on i, you can see also that this vector in the complex plane, a, b, has length which would be computed and equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Since we can represent complex numbers with vectors and the triangle inequality applies for vectors, the triangle inequality also applies for complex numbers. If we have two complex numbers, z1 and z2, then the absolute value of their sum will be less than or equal to the sum of their absolute values. Now for complex multiplication. It says the geometrical interpretation of multiplication by a complex number, z equals a plus ib, or bi, whichever order you prefer, equals r times e to the i theta is multiplication of the modulus by r combined with addition of theta to the angle with the x-axis. Let me continue labeling our diagram up here to make this a little bit clearer. Now that I've added this, this may look a little bit more familiar to you as a polar coordinate sensibility of the complex plane. r is the length of this vector and theta is the angle here. And when we start thinking about what happens when we multiply a number by a complex number in an attempt to write down what that matrix might look like, let's take a look at this plane first. Looking at what would happen to the standard basis vectors if they were multiplied by a plus bi, we get a better sense of what's happening. That's what we mean by geometrical interpretation. We want to see what's happening to the standard basis vectors. 
So if we start with our first basis vector, which is 1, 0, which in this plane can be drawn as this, but algebraically is represented as just 1 in the a slot and 0 in the b slot. So this is the real number 1. When we multiply this by a plus bi, we're just going to get back a plus bi, which is represented by this vector. Well, what has happened to our standard basis vector to get here? Well, it's rotated through this angle theta, and then it's scaled by r. Then if you think about the second standard basis vector, that would be 0, 1, which represents i. Okay, well what happens if i is multiplied by a plus bi? Do the work on your paper in a couple seconds. Here it is. We get back ai minus b. Now, you don't have to draw this onto your plane, but I will. Here it is. Note that because of i being multiplied by a, a is now the coefficient on i, and so we go up this axis by a units. And then b, when bi gets multiplied by i, that turns into negative b, and so negative b becomes the real component of this vector. It still has the same length as this one, but it has different components. This is not an isometry, right? Distance between points is not kept constant, but it's important for you guys to see the skills that you've picked up over the class so far be put to use here. That I took the standard basis vectors and I said, okay, well, if I'm taking the standard basis vector, what does it mean in terms of complex numbers? What do I want to map it into? Okay, that's my first column, right? It turns into AB or r cosine theta, r sine theta, if we're looking at this length and this angle theta, because 1 times a plus bi is just a plus bi, and then we ask ourselves, okay, here's the second standard basis vector. It's 0, 1. What does that represent with respect to the complex numbers? That's i, and what happens to i when you multiply it by a plus bi? Well, that's going to give me ai minus b, or this vector minus ba, or if we're thinking about this right here being theta, and we look at the length r along here, this is now uh, minus r sine theta and r cosine theta. Sorry, I started to run out of space, so the a is really the intercept value up here. It's not the length of this. Know that the length of this is b. So this matrix is a product of a constant matrix, r0, 0, 0, r, that is stretching these standard basis vectors. These are length 1. These are length r. And then the rotation matrix, which is pivoting them through this angle theta right here. It's worth noting that if we start out with a complex number like this and rewrite it in terms of r and theta, we would have r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta, like this. And then we would just apply Euler's formula to get it reduced down to r times e to the i theta. As we said earlier, uh, this matrix either is you've written AB or negative BA or in terms of R and theta, it's the same thing either way. It's not an isometry because the length of these vectors change after the transformation. It's called a conformal matrix. It preserves angles, but it doesn't preserve length. It's worth noting something pretty cool about conformal matrices. Uh, and obviously, when we're first talking about matrices, in general, they don't form a field because, as we discussed last week, multiplication is not commutative. Order matters, and commutativity of multiplication is one of the axioms that needs to be satisfied for something to be considered a field. But there are two exceptions. One is n by n matrices that are multiples of the identity matrix. You can toy around with those. Again, the identity matrix is... Uh, ones along the main diagonal and then zeros everywhere else. And the other exception is the set of two by two conformal matrices. What's cool about conformal matrices is that you can multiply them in any order and the product is the same. So in general, matrices do not form a field, two by two matrices do not form a field, but if we limit which matrices we're talking about and say two by two conformal matrices, they do form a field. They satisfy
that commutativity of multiplication that is so important, as do those multiples of the identity matrix. So what have we talked about in this section? We've talked about how we can use vectors to represent complex numbers. We've talked about how we can use matrices to represent complex multiplication and how we sort of figured out what that matrix might look like and what's the linear transformation that it represents in the plane. And we talked about which sets of matrices specifically form fields.